Are you ready? No. Let's go. Now circling in the neutral zone. Here's the pitch on the way. 36 yards for the win. This. Here comes a big chance. The shot is. Is this the tagger? The neutral zone. Oh, oh my God. God. This is as good as it gets. The neutral zone is brought to you by the Ontario Para Network. Follow them online at onpara.ca. Now, here's your host, two-time Paralympian, Rock Richardson. What's going on? It's time for another edition of The Neutral Zone. I am indeed your host, Brock Richardson. And today we have the pleasure of being joined by Devin Haru, who is preparing for the Paralympic Games, which begin tomorrow, if you're listening to the podcast, on the day of release. Um, it was a wonderful interview that Cameron and I uh, got to um, do earlier this week, so you'll hear that. Plus, we're going to discuss this idea of of cardboard beds in the village and was accessibility taken into account when putting this all together we'll talk all about that plus your headlines which are coming at you right now neutral zone headlines Headlines. top ranked tennis player yannick sinner tested positive twice for a banned anabolic steroid in march and was stripped of prize money and points earned at a tournament in indian wells california but will not be suspended because an independent tribunal said it was not intentional the controversy centers on a pair of tests that center failed over an eight-day period in march testing positive both times for quote unquote low levels of a banned substance called clostebol according to the ITIA clostebol is an anabolic steroid that has a history of use as a performance enhancing drug in sports in fact in 2022 San Diego Padres star Fernando Tatis Jr was suspended for 80 major league baseball games after testing positive for it in the US it's a schedule 3 controlled substance Basically, what happened was that Sinner's physiotherapist accidentally cut his finger and treated the wound each day with a medical spray, which contained Clostebol, that he had purchased while in Italy and brought to California by a second member of Sinner's entourage, a fitness coach. Then, without washing his hands or wearing gloves, the physiotherapist massaged Sinner's body and helped him with foot exercises, according to records. Ultimately, Sinner was cleared of fault, but as mentioned, the arbitrator did vacate his results at Indian Wells, forcing him to return the $325,000 in prize money. Uh, kind of an interesting story there. Yeah, no kidding. The Ontario Para Network is throwing a Paralympic watch party on September 7th at Variety Village. It's going to be an exciting day of not only watching our Paralympic athletes compete, but there will be opportunities to try multiple para sports. There will be a silent auction, and there will be Team Canada alumni in attendance as well so register at www.onpara.ca and we look forward to seeing everybody out at the event it's going to be a fun one and uh let's cheer on our paralympic athletes yes it's important to cheer on our paralympic athletes i will be cheering on our colleague josh watson as he says his i do's on said day i think if i didn't come to that i would be in a lot of trouble considering that i agreed to be the mc so that's what i'll be doing but i would love to be at an event like that and i would encourage people to um get involved if they can because those things are very fun to be a part of what is also fun to be a part of is the u.s open uh tennis tournament which is taking place this week and next and we have a Lots of Canadian athletes who are taking part. I'm looking forward to seeing what Denis Shapovalov, Felix Oje Aliassime does, and of course Bianca Andrescu, and a few more Canadians as well. This tennis tournament was last won by a Canadian in 2019 when Bianca Andrescu uh, took home that title. She said in an in a article recently that she at one time lost her love of tennis but has found it back through meditation and she now knows because of this process that she will never lose the love of tennis and she knows that she will always have tennis in her 
heart and head as she moves forward. Those are your headlines for this week. If you want to get a hold of us on social media, here's how you can do that. And welcome back to the Neutral Zone broadcast booth. Play ball! We're set to get this ball game underway. The first pitch is brought to you by Brock Richardson's X account at Neutral Zone BR. Right. Pitch and a strike. Hey, gang, why not strike up a chat with Claire Buchanan from the Neutral Zone? Find her on X at Neutral Zone CB. There's a swing of the chopper out to second base right at Claire as she picks up the ball, throws it over to the first base for a routine play. Out. And fans, there's nothing routine about connecting with Cam and Josh from the Neutral Zone at Neutral Zone Cam J and at J Watson 200. And the Neutral Zone is brought to you by the Ontario Para Network. Connect with them at ON Para Network. Follow them online at onpara.ca. Now that's a winning combination. As mentioned off the top, Cameron and I had an opportunity to speak with Devin Haru live from France as he prepares for the Paralympic Games. Here's how that interview sounded. Please enjoy. We're joined by Devin Haru, who has been a great friend of the program. And he is actually, as we're doing this interview, he's actually joining us from Paris as he's between the Olympic and Paralympic Games, which uh, may have already gotten going or have just getting going depends when we release this interview because quite frankly i haven't yet decided so it depends when this interview is going to be released devin thank you so much for joining us and my goodness are you ever looking dapper today i am doing my best uh fake it till you make it right um what day is it where are we are we still in the summer that's how i'm feeling right now but listen finally the Paralympics, and I know many of you will say the real games have arrived. Um, and so this is exciting. This is fantastic. Let me tell you, I was just at the Arc de Triomphe, where, of course, the Agitos is uh, displayed wonderfully. The sun blasting down on it on the Champs Elysees, where, of course, the opening ceremony is going to take place. The city is ready. This feels like such a pivotal moment in the Paralympic movement. And I know we'll probably talk about that, but there was such momentum. Momentum. Uh, when it was in London, of course, it seems like yesterday, but 12 years ago. And it really feels like the energy is back. Uh, we had the pandemic games where fans couldn't be there. Now we're here, games wide open. Let's get this party started. Well, Dapper Devin, uh, how would you categorize uh, the Olympic Games as a whole for Team Canada? Let's kind of wrap up the Olympic Games before we get started on the Paralympic Games. Yeah, I, you know what? Obviously, uh, because of the medal hall and it being uh, the second most um, successful medal hall for Canada outside of the boycotted games in 1984, I think that was successful. But let me tell you guys. That was one hell of a roller coaster, um, just emotionally, right? Because you had so many surprise moments, historic medal winners, first evers, but you also had the controversy of the women's soccer team. You had the heartbreak of, of Damian Warner in the decathlon, uh, no hiding on the pole vault. You had Mo Ahmed just missing out on a medal in the 10,000 meter and then falling in the 5,000 meter. Like it really felt like I was just like, you know, I always say buckle up and I felt like I was buckled up throughout all of that. Um, and yet, let me tell you, um, because I took on this broadcast role for the first time ever, I really felt, and I don't know what you guys think about this, that Canadian athletes led us closer to them and were more revealing than I can ever recall. They, the, the, it was just that the interviews were so raw and so candid that it was just, it was wonderful to bear witness. I felt very honored and privileged to have a front row seat to these athletes pouring their heart into this and, um, and just opening up in triumph and defeat. One of my favorite poems ever is by Rudyard Kipling, If. And in that poem, it says, if you can meet triumph and disaster just the same. And I think our athletes met triumph and disaster just the same with grace and poise and humility in a quintessentially Canadian way. And I'm really 
I, I hope this doesn't sound weird, but I'm really proud of the way Team Canada athletes carried themselves in Paris. Obviously, uh, Devin, as you mentioned, you mentioned the uh, Canada soccer situation and the drone story. That was a big, big deal prior to the games. Do you feel that that... Uh, six point sanction was a bit too far i mean i agree with the coaches going home i i get all that 100 percent. but my goodness the six point sanction was just steep do you agree yeah it was and i you know there were a lot of conversations happening here and in the background i think the feeling was that when they appealed it to the court of arbitration for sport that there was going to be just three points taken away which made sense to me Take away the three points from the New Zealand game. That was a no-brainer to me. But the six really did, did feel harsh. And you have to imagine just the energetic toll it took on the women to mentally wrap their head around what they were up against just to advance to that quarterfinal game and what a ride they took us all on. It feels like the women's soccer team supplies endless drama for us at every games, but you have to believe their, their tanks were running on empty by the, by the time they got to that point, just knowing what they were up against. Um, but what, what a mess, right? Like what, what a mess. And we can, we can, we, we don't have enough time on this podcast to talk about, you know, do other teams do it? Of course they do it. And of course other countries have been doing it. And of course this is a part of footy culture, but guess what? It was the Olympics with some of the highest restriction and security imaginable um, in a country where air surveillance is as strict as any place in the world. What were they thinking? Yep. What were they thinking? I think to me that that is a sentiment shared by many. So, um, you know, to be continued, of course, because there's going to be a lot of fallout and there's going to be a lot more uh, detail that comes out in all of this. But um, it, it, it certainly put a dark cloud to start the games. And as a reporter, I'm not afraid to get in the trenches. I think you guys know that about me. I'm not afraid. I mean, I went to the opening press conference and I asked them if they were comfortable with the team continuing to play. I'm not afraid to ask those questions. But I want to talk about performance and athletes and, and, and triumph and disaster, not scandal, especially when it doesn't have to do with the athletes. So it was a mess. It was unfortunate. We knew the Olympic cycle is so vicious, right? Like people win medals. Everybody's happy. Controversy. Everybody's mad. Somebody wins a gold. Everybody's happy again. It's just, it, it's, that's how it downs. goes, you know? So exactly. Ups ups and downs yeah now Devin, do you think it's fair to categorize uh the women's soccer team as a success as a sorry as an a success story um, because i certainly do and what the uh, women overcame uh, to get as far as they did yeah i think it is i think i think you know, you know what I had talked about in the background throughout all of that is it really, you know, there was a lot of vitriol and a lot of hate and a lot of frustrated Canadians when they didn't really know the extent of everything and the role the women had in this and what they knew and what they didn't know. But I think when it became apparent that this was a coach led thing and that it was the athletes who really didn't have any knowledge of this you sort of felt the entire pendulum swing in favor of the players. And I think credit to a lot of those veterans on that team who gave some really impassioned post-game interviews, because I really think it, it, it galvanized the country to want to rally around these women. And like I said, the fact that they made it out of the group stage was to me a success. And, um, and I think those women should be proud of themselves. I really do. And I think that's how Canadians will remember the effort of the Canadian soccer team here in Paris. For you, as you look back on these games, was there a surprise medalist for Canada? Alicia Newman, the pole vaulter. Um, and I've covered uh, Alicia, you know, for a long time. D surprise, like, here's the thing. I've always known it was within her to do that. She hasn't been able to put it together on the international stage. It's, here's what I'll say, guys. 
To me, the magic of the Olympics and the Paralympics has really crystallized for me in that there's going to be one day in these athletes' life. For some of them, it's 9.84 seconds. For some, it's a baton toss on a relay. Or for Alicia Newman, it's catapulting herself over a bar with another bar. And on that singular day, you have to hope like heck that you are dialed in and you're the best in the world. It gives me goosebumps. It really does because I have bad days as a reporter and I can fake it sometimes and I screw up my words. But guess what? I don't miss out on qualifying for a final if I say the wrong thing. If Damian Warner doesn't get over the pole with the other pole on three tries, his Olympics are done for th three years, but really an entire lifetime is gone over three. And like, I can remember watching Damien and you're like, oh, first miss, nothing. Second miss, oh, okay. Ooh, 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 this is getting uncomfortable. And then you're literally staring your life in, in like everything in your life, you're staring at a pole in a stadium in Paris and it's over. And that's what these athletes face every day at the Paralympics and Olympics. It's, it's crushing pressure and that's what makes it more incredible to me when they succeed. So Alicia did it, um, fencing medal, judo medal, um, diving medals. I just, I gained an entirely new, summer was brilliant. I gained an entirely new respect for our athletes because I felt closer to it than ever before. And I just, I felt like I was teetering edge on the edge of the diving board. And I felt like I was on the start line with them. And it just, it, I, I, it was white knuckle for me the entire time. So that's how I'll answer that. And I think I might know your number one uh, disappointment for Canada at the Games, but why don't you tell us? What do you think were some of the disappointments, unfortunately, for Canada? Well, did I – was was my hot, my hot take that the Canadian men's basketball team was going to make it to the gold Yeah, I think game? it was. Did I say yeah. that? Sure yeah, was. We hung on sure to that was. too. Yeah. We lost that tape. Suddenly we ran out of storage. Um, I put it out of my hardware. <laughs> it's out yeah. of my, it's, it's, it's just, the memory drive is gone. That was really disappointing. It, you know, like it, it truly was. They looked completely overwhelmed against France. And, you know, when I saw that matchup, my heart sank. And I think everybody's heart sank because it was like, of course we have to play the hosts in a do or die elimination game. You know, like, like, you know, you know, during the, the Vancouver games, there was this feeling of an invincibility around the Canadian teams because we had the country at our back. I'm telling you, I have been in some pretty incredible venues throughout my career. The noise and the energy in Stade de France, in La Défense Arena, in the streets when a game was on, was unlike anything I've ever felt. I can't imagine what it was like inside that that venue when when they were steamrolling the Canadians and when they quite honestly almost beat the Americans in the final, if not for Steph Curry. So massively disappointing. It felt like it was a step back for the program, I think, um, because it really felt like everybody was all in. And I think they needed to get to a medal game to make it feel like it was a success. That's just my opinion. Devin, we're going to get to the Paralympics in just a second, but I have to ask you this because it's been something that's been totally uh, burning in my brain since the time it happened, and I, I just don't understand this, and maybe you can, you can shed some light on, on this for me, but we had Summer and Ethan uh, be the flag bearers for Canada in the closing ceremonies. Makes complete sense, but... Summer got home like a week before the opening ceremonies and then Ethan was in like Switzerland or something like that. Why did they have them leave? Is there some reason they left or 
could have they just stayed there and not gone home and come back? Like to me, this is just blows my mind. Can you shed some light on this? Well, I, 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 I do know why. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if I, I think I can share. Summer, summer yeah, went home. Are we still here? Yep. Are we still connected? We're good. Um, there was already a celebration and, and a party planned for summer at her cottage in Muskoka. It was always, it was always a plan to have her go back and to have her friends there. And summer's birthday was, uh, August 18th. And they and to make it all work with everything going on, she was always going home to have that celebration at the cottage in the Muskokas. So she was up there. That's why she went back. But I will remind everybody that Penny Alexiak did the same thing in 2016. She left because swimming ended as early as it did. There, there were there's like nine days left of the Olympics. So so Penny went back and I saw all the conversations and I didn't weigh in because I didn't know if it was my business to share that summer was going to Muskoka and having a birthday party and all her friends were there. And plus, summer is massively humble, like Jill and, and all of them would never assume that she was going to be the closing flag bearer. Like that's the way they operate. Like in all of my conversations with Jill in that time period was like, we don't know, we don't know. So I know that everybody thought it was, but that's the type of person she is. And I think it was probably the same with Ethan, right? Like, although Ethan's was later, I think, I think it was closer to, and then I think he might've went away. It's easy to travel in Europe. It's a train ride here and a train ride there, but they don't make that decision until the Saturday night before the Sunday. So there are still things that could happen on that Saturday that could affect Canada's flag bear, it, what is what my understanding was. So I hope that sheds a little bit of light on it. Thank you, because I was literally sitting going, what well, she was home and she's back. Like I was ready to do reports on, on other networks being I, I actually, I did because I thought, I thought, Oh, and, and my colleague agreed with me, you know, I would saw, saw her leave and it was like, Oh, I guess she's not the, the, the flag bearer. And then we were debating on, okay, is it Ethan? And then, and then the, the, the woman on top of that. And then it was like, no, it's summer again. So thank you for shedding that light. It, it puts my mind at ease. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so I'm here to put your mind at ease. So let's get to some Paralympics. And we'll start off by asking you, uh, who do you think is going to win the first medal for Canada? That is a really good question. Is it, 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 I think it could potentially be in the pool. I think it, put, it could put, it's it's been in the pool a lot, has it not? Yeah, absolutely, it has I been. So. To, to to win the first medal. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think it's probably going to be in the medal uh, in the pool as well. Yeah, I think I think it'll be in the pool. Um, I'm everywhere. The the hard thing for me at the Paralympics is unlike at the Olympics where we have a bigger crew on the ground, um, and I'm at swimming and I'm at athletics. Like opening day, I am at, um, where am I at on opening day? I'm at women's wheelchair basketball on the evening. And then earlier in the day, I don't even know where I am. I, that's, that's where I'm at. But all of that to say, I'm going to be at swimming for the evening sessions uh, on day two and day three. I'm going to be a lot at athletics. I think my first evening at athletics is going to be for Brent Lakatos, um, who I believe will at that point be going for either a 12th or a 13th Paralympic medal. Um, you know what's funny about Brent? He thought he was going to retire after 2008. 2008? In Beijing. Wow. And then he thought he was going to retire after London. And then he thought he was going to retire after Rio. And then in Tokyo, he told me he was done. And guess what? Guess who's back? Brent Lakatos. Orly Rivard is going to be a star. I think Orly has a lot to prove in the pool. I don't think she was overly happy about, about 
parts of her Tokyo experience. 10 Paralympic medals, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that's greatness when you're, when you're not happy about that. Um, but I think, I think the first medal will come at the pool. I hope it is because it was the same case, I think, uh, for the Olympics as well, if I'm not mistaken. So yep, it was. I think summer, I summer, so. summer, summer won the uh, silver in the 400 meter freestyle. So I'm going to say swimming, who it's going to be. Clearly, I have work to do. I'm still compiling all my lists of where I need to be. But I will say in the pool, in the pool. at La Defense Arena where there is magic in the water for Canada. So the two things I've just gotten from this uh, conversation with you is, is that it's going to be in the pool and Brent Lakatos is a liar. He doesn't know when he's going to be uh, um, taking off from the uh, Paralympics. I can't wait to talk to him because you'll know his his uh, partner, Steph Reed, is a, a part of our broadcast team, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I can't wait to, to, to have some fun with that throughout the broadcast. And, <laughs> and, and perhaps I can even be a part of the show and say, Steph, walk me through what this conversation at the dinner table has been like. <laughs> I think I think I think it's going to be awesome. I think this is going to be very special for them because it, I, I find it remarkable that and Steph is so outstanding. Um to have her on the broadcast, to have Brent still competing, to me, if there is a time to retire, this maybe feels like this is it with all the stars finally aligning. But I was going back through my research and looking at some of the interviews I had done with Brent, and, and he he has said since 2008 he thought he was going to retire. Um, and he just can't stop. And I get it. And I get it. So that's fantastic. It's the love of sports. It really is. Uh, yes. Devin, I, I'm taking this uh, right from your ex account because I, as we're doing this, I looked it up on the fly because I saw it and then forgot to pin it. Um, but Paris has these signs all over Paris and it says game is not over with a gentleman uh, raising his arms in the air and it's a big sign and the is not is on a flag and it's white and it's very cool. Do you believe that this is the close to the best Paralympic promotion in the city that you can think of? Because I've never seen anything like this sign and I am here for it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, because I've been all over the city. I got back here a few days ago. I've been all over the city. You can't go on a street or a subway without seeing some type of sign like that game is not over. There's a part of me that wants to grammatically correct it and say games are not over, but <laughs> just because it's, it, it maybe sounds better. Maybe it was lost in translation, but game is not over. Um, it's fantastic. Here's the thing about this guys. And I know, I know we know this, but for anybody who's tuning in and, and, you know, I did my little PSA on, on Paralympics, not para Olympics. And we get, we get that all the time. And I try not to be snarky and snippy about it. I try and, and bring people in. That's always been my thing. The, the, we know that these games are so much more than a nine, 10, 11 day display of athleticism um, from people with disabilities. We know that. Paris is not an accessible city. It was built at a time with cobblestones where they weren't thinking about wheelchairs getting into places. So since 2017, when Paris was awarded the games, this city has taken up the challenge to become a more inclusive and more accessible city. And there are places where you see that everywhere we go. The opening ceremony is literally taking place on the Champs Elysees, which is cobblestone. And from everything that I've heard, they're going to ro roll out the red carpet. And that thing is going to be lit up for the first time in Paralympic history. The opening ceremony is going to take place outside of a, a, a stadium. They could have taken the easy path. Stade de France, easy to get in, easy to go around the track. That would have been easy, right? How bad would that have looked if they would have taken that route after they had the Olympic opening ceremony out in the open? Because we know the slogan here is games wide open. But credit to Paris 2024, they haven't taken any shortcuts. 
They've seen the bigger call to action. They've seen the legacy. We know that in the wake of the Paralympics, the public perception of people with disabilities changes. And everywhere you go, that is apparent here in Paris. I think they're creeping close to 2 million tickets sold. I think they're going to get close to, sma to beating the record from London. And I can tell you that out of those millions of tickets sold, it's upwards to about 92, 93, 94% of French residents. And what I've heard anecdotally from people living here is they were so pissed off about all of the things going on during the Olympics. And then they saw the party when they left. Now everybody's coming back to Paris and scooping up the Paralympic tickets because they don't want to miss the party. Party. And that is just absolutely fantastic. So it's, it's what it should be. Fans back in the places. The, the performances are going to be better because of that. The athletes are going to be treated the way they should. And when you have all of those things working in tandem, you get more media coverage, you get more people caring, and you get more spotlight on the athletes to tell their stories and to show their athleticism. I'm so excited for this. I, I really, I really am, am tired talking about the lead up. I'm just so ready for the competition, not the participation, the competition. No participation, uh, no participation uh, ribbons at the, these games, that's for sure. I just, I absolutely love our interviews when we get the opportunity to do them. There's so much fun. Your enthusiasm is incredible. And we really appreciate it. Because, guys, like, for the audience out there, I I know you're not visibly seeing this anymore because we're just audio podcast. But, like, Devin is at a coffee shop sitting behind a, what looks like a castle. This guy could be doing far more important things than sitting with us. And he chose to spend 25 minutes and sit with us. And we are forever grateful. Devin, thank you so much for doing this. And best of luck with the games and running around like a chicken with your head cut off for nine days. Enjoy it. And thank you so much. I'm not going to miss a moment fueled by croissants and caffeine and uh, soak up every second of it. Our Canadians are ready, 126 strong. They're really gonna make us proud. So enjoy it, guys. Thank you very much, Devin. Really appreciate it. The Neutral Zone is sponsored by the Ontario Para Network. Their focus on the growth and development of wheelchair basketball, tennis, and rugby in Ontario. There's been a few things, guys, that is puzzled me through this whole Olympic or Paralympic process and because we're not quite at the Paralympic Games we can't come on here of course and tell you about results because as we record this it hasn't started yet but I want to talk a little bit about the fact that accessibility whether it was or wasn't taken into account. And I want to preface this before starting this conversation. We have no involvement in this. We have no inside sources necessarily, but I thought it would be an interesting conversation to, ha to be had here uh, as well. So we know exactly what's uh, being taken into with these uh, cardboard beds and all things that I understand is that they are single beds and so some people with accessibility requirements require bigger beds um, that are bigger than single because of uh, just their body movements and risk of not falling out of the bed and all of this could impact your performance so the question here is that do we think with all of these things, if we're including, you know, pressure sores, scoliosis, uh, curvature of the spine, all that kind of thing, is it on the Paralympic Committee to do more than just put a single cardboard bed? Or is it on the athlete to know what they need uh, and bring what they need? I'll start with Claire on this one. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I hope that it's a mix of both. I hope that the IPC obviously put into account uh, just the different issues and circumstances that uh, come into play when 
you're talking about Paralympic athletes and and disabled bodies and of course safety and and making sure that those athletes are are comfortable while being uh, treated with again putting safety as a a focus point. Uh, I I think we've all seen uh, videos from. Uh, the Olympic athletes and and both the Olympic and Paralympic athletes from uh, previous uh, Paralympic Games as well because this isn't this isn't the first games that they've used these cardboard beds. Um, I believe they use the same ones at Tokyo and just had great response and and reviews from them. Um, but yeah, the the athletes themselves are posting reviews about the beds themselves. If if you're uh, if you're not following Zach Madel right now, you you should. He's he's not only showing you around the Paralympic Village right now, but uh, giving the reviews on the bed and and the food and and so I I am intrigued. I am intrigued to see what the response is um, from those athletes specifically uh, throughout the games and and possibly having an athlete maybe come on the show, uh, after the games is, is over to get some insight. But, uh, I would hope that it would be an option that if they needed one, a bigger size bed, uh, that they could either accommodate that or, or bring in a secondary single bed to kind of put beside the one that is already there to make it uh, a larger space. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they were they were used in Tokyo, and I I don't remember seeing any negative feedback from them uh, on the beds. So I I hope that they're they're just uh, one comfortable, but also keeping the athletes safe. Absolutely, I would certainly hope that we would have safety in mind. However, I'm maybe slightly less optimistic. Um, I I know people in our own lives who have trouble accommodating our needs at times. And so I can't imagine a large entity like the IPC actually being able to get it right. But then again, maybe that's my own cynicism. I was able to find during a quick Google search that the beds do come in a standard dimension of three feet wide and six and a half feet in length. However, it does say that they can be extended to 2.2 meters for tall athletic superstars like seven foot to basketball player Victor Wembanyama. So it seems like there is some flexibility in the size of the beds. So hopefully they can be configured in such a way that they can actually accommodate, or as you said, perhaps they can double them up where necessary. Um, I, I would hope that's a given, but I guess, again, maybe my cynicism is a little too high. I just, I think you, you get told this is what you get, and if you need something else, figure it out. <laughs> so I've had experience at two Paralympic Games, 2008 and 2012, and I would suggest to both of you and anyone listening to this podcast that they did as much as they could within reason. And what I'm saying in the sense of within reason was that you couldn't just ask for the world. So what you couldn't do was say, well, um, I need a second bed. So provide me with a full second bed uh, beside me. Um, whether that's changed now versus then, I can't speak to that. I have been speaking with people at the village who have said to me, yeah, it's still not totally an option to get another bed, but as you guys aptly point, or as Josh aptly points out with the uh, dimension change, you can obviously do that. Um, there were people that would say, you know, can I have a softer pillow versus a firmer pillow? Sure, those are easy to to uh, accommodate, and they have that available to you. They also had. Um, for some people, and this was considered limited use, and I put that in quotes, uh, was memory foam uh, that if you needed it for pressure sores and those kind of things, those were available, but it was on limited use 
per delegation. So like the Canadian Paralympic Committee would only have, you know, maybe 10 of those for a hundred and something athletes. It's not like they could, if every athlete came and said we needed, you know, memory foam as our, as our, um, requirements they, they're they not providing it to a hundred and something athletes for that I, I think the canadian paralympic committee and the ipc as well will do everything they can in to make your stay um you know manageable for you again i have seen some of these tours that you're talking about with the village this village seems to be an outstanding village um something that you know Devin brought up in today's interview which I I want to get both of, both of your thoughts on as well was just the 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 want for Paris to have um the, these games and I asked him point blank I said you know Devin I I've been to two Paralympic games and one of the signs that um that he posted on his social media was the game is not over is it grammatically correct, as you pointed out, as you just heard? No, but the point is they've understood that the games are not, are not over, and they believe in the in the in the Paralympic Games. And for me, I love this, and I love what I've seen from Paris. Do you guys think that Paris has shown with signs like this? We're buying fully into the Paralympic Games. Josh, start with you, and then we'll go right over to Claire. I'm not personally sure how Paris is making the transition from Olympics to Paralympics. I've only seen certain things like man on the street interviews where people are asked, you know, do you know what that symbol is on the Arc de Triomphe? Um, having said that, I have read where a number of the venues are selling out for the Paralympics. And I think that tells me that the fans and the people of, of Paris understand that there is something more happening and that they need to be a part of it, which I'm very excited for. Yeah, I agree with you. I think we saw uh, initially in, in 2012 uh, the way that London really brought uh, up the effort into uh, ex the exposure of the Paralympic Games and and making it an, an exciting thing to to get ready for. And uh, leading up to Paris, I think that they did a very good job of showing that uh, they want to uh, elevate uh, the games comparatively to uh, previous years. And uh, they did that uh, really well with the Olympics. And yeah, there's some things that are up in the air that I'm curious about. One, yeah, the beds. That'd be an interesting conversation to have with with kind of a higher level disabled athlete to see how that was navigated. Uh, another one is the, for me, is, is the opening ceremonies is, is, is it realistic and, and logical to, to have disabled athletes all put on, uh, numerous boats going down the river? Like, how is that going to work? And, uh, there's just, there is a couple of things up in the air, but again, like you, uh, noted Josh, uh, stadiums are selling out. For the Paralympic Games, and that's huge. That that in itself shows that uh, Paris and uh, France did a fantastic job of, of promoting how great the Paralympic Games are going to be. And and the yeah, it, it sounds like the uh, the people of of that country are are invested and excited to to witness it. So it's uh, I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point you bring up. I remember in 2012 seeing the ads and things from from team gb as they were known and they really turned that team into rock stars so i'm i'm really hopeful to see the same thing again this year so we'll see what happens yeah it's um Devin did make note that they are not taking the easy way in just using the track stadium as uh part of their opening ceremonies they're doing it 
the more challenging way and and using the outdoor venue as they did but there was no mention of boats and i didn't have time with devin to actually say so is there boats because i was i i was concerned about you know flag bearers that went home and came back and and so i didn't (laughs) get my chance to to ask him about the boats but he told us point blank Paris is not stopping at anything and not taking the easy route because they want to surpass London's ticket sales for the Paralympic Games. They want to be known as we're we're the bigger games. We're not necessarily the better games, even though I'm sure that people from Paris would love to 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 be known as that but it just feels like they want to do things a step above and people are coming back for the the Paralympic Games because it's like what's going on here it's like they have the fear of missing out sort of thing and that's what you love to see about the Paralympics you you love to see that oh I don't want to miss out on this and it's just been a wonderful job the International Paralympic Committee on TikTok has done an incredible job of showcasing para athletes in a humorous way. And at times, I've seen, I've seen posts where I'm like, "Ooh, that's uh, going down an interesting line there that you're going." But I'm sure they got permissions to do it, and they're doing it with such a a positive purpose that that's the way I feel about it. I mean. I will be biased because I was there and I I will tell you that I don't know that anyone will be able to surpass what London did because you could literally go anywhere at any point in any part of the village and turn on whichever live feed you wanted for, for the sports and that carried through the BBC, the disability channel that they have. I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but it just carried through and I think Paris is going to want to do that and do it more with the pomp and circumstance and the flashy and the and the Eiffel Tower and the whole thing and I mean I'm I'm watching people go through and I can't tell you how many pictures I have seen of people underneath the Eiffel Tower and you know do it because it is it's a it's a one of the seven wonders of the world and I think people are are delving into that how as a consumer do you look at this when you watch it either on CBC Gem or whatever uh, regime you watch it on? How as a purely consumer do you guys identify success versus failure? And not I'm not talking medal count. I'm talking purely France and what they do. Josh, start with you on this one. That's an interesting question, and I'm sorry for the pregnant pause there. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the question a little bit. I guess from my standpoint, you're asking what would make the Paris Games a success. I think that will entail, you know, was everyone able to get to the venue that they wanted to get to? Were I I don't know that the athlete village is going to be the same as it was when you experienced it just because of the rules surrounding people staying and people going, which we talked about during the Olympics. Um, So I don't know that it matters as much that you be able to access the different feeds of the different sports because you might not be there that long. Um, But can, can the venues be full? Is security high to a point where everyone is safe but not so intrusive that you're watching say the the road cycling race and you see cops lining the route you know that sort of thing to me would make it a a success i have been watching quite a bit of uh high performance sport on cbc gem it's it's a fantastic app and it's it's the one that I choose uh, for Paralympic and Olympic Games. And uh, I guess my point of view from uh, just viewership standpoint is, one, yes, we're getting closer and closer to kind of equal broadcasting um, between both Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, but also what we're actually seeing in those broadcasts. Uh, I 
I know we're going to see the quote unquote more popular sports, but they're only that popular because that's what they show. Uh, I hope that I will be able to see sports that I haven't watched before uh, at the Paralympic Games. And uh, I think that's something that uh, I know myself experienced recently watching these Olympic Games is uh, they were showing sports that traditionally I wouldn't have caught in previous games and um, watching sports that uh, I just haven't been able to experience. So I hope I get that same experience with the Paralympic Games of, oh, wow, I've never seen this sport before uh, at such a high level. And and now I get to see uh, the stars of that sport and learn those stories because we're not just watching uh, a competition where we're hearing stories about these athletes and, and, and getting to know more people within the parasport world. And I think that would be a huge check mark if, if we now have a new, uh, group and era of, of quote unquote para superstars that, uh, we, we can follow. I'll put this pretty, um, simplistically here. I think the way that I define success uh, outside of the medal count and and what we do result wise is what's the overall effect on people coming back and I I want to hear from everybody of all different um, countries what's what is the feedback given on the experience of the whole games Devin. Haru has agreed to come back and have that, you know, very conversation because to me, that's, that's the way that I look at it. Was everybody happy? Was everybody satisfied whether you won a medal or you were in first place in the middle towards the bottom of the pack, whatever, was everybody happy with the experience? Because I've been on other programs wondering about that experience and this one because of that 48 hours once you're, Paralympic time is over. And so for me, will it be a resounding success as long as the athletes come back and say so? Because that's the barometer that only we can use is not being in Paris and the people that we know that were in Paris and use that. Uh, we know what the medal count's going to be, and that's what's going to define, you know, success versus failure f- from the field of play. But I'm looking at it from more what did the people say regarding the whole experience. Uh, to close the show, I just wanted to chat a little bit about uh, something that's worrying me also, and that's uh, fatigue. I have been hearing a few different teams having to because most teams go to the Paralympic Games uh, ahead of when the village opened. It opened uh, this uh, past weekend on Saturday, from what I understand, and that's when people could move in. But a lot of teams have been going uh, prior to to do their own training. And there was a couple of teams that have had to travel a little bit uh, to do that, upwards of three hours away from the village and then having to come back. With the level of disability, uh, even though this is a decision made on the own national sports organization to do this, with the level of travel, because the village is not open, the venues are not open, there's limited space, is fatigue for you guys in that sense a bit of a factor because some teams have had to travel outside just due to limited resources and venues available to train in? Start with uh, Claire on this one and move over to Josh. Yeah, like you said, it's it's really on the NSO uh, to kind of make that final call of what the week or two leading up to the games looks like. And if we look at organizations like Wheelchair Basketball Canada, they've already been in Europe for a couple of weeks already. So uh, I don't think that a lot of the teams are are kind of feeling rushed or kind of chaotic of going back and forth. And I think that uh, from what I'm seeing, uh, certain sports uh, are strategically planning uh, well ahead of time as they should. Yes. But also really being conscious of, of the location of both the Paralympic games and, and where they go, uh, leading up to it. So I it's fatigue is going to happen in sports, especially at a high level. 
and it's it's the Paralympic Games. It's it's going to be the busiest, the most chaotic, and kind of everything all at once happening uh, event that athletes are going to experience, and that's just the nature of it. Uh, no matter where they're located, is uh, that's just something that you have to prepare for, and it's it's when you take into account those other things uh, outside of training that are going to help that. Uh, more sleep, more hydration and, and eating the right foods and just planning your day out properly. So, uh, just, I hope those athletes and the NSOs of course are, are being conscious and, and speaking up when they are feeling fatigued so they can, uh, prepare themselves and, and be ready. But these are high performance athletes. I, I fatigue ha- happens and, and, and when it does, you, you got to tackle it. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure they're doing a great job. Yeah, from my perspective, I would say it is up to the athlete first and foremost, then the coach and the NSO to say, okay, we do have this travel day or this this travel time in order to train. Um, are we going to do it yay or nay? Uh, I think at the end of it, it's up to the athletes and the coaches to know what they can handle. And as you said, they are world-class athletes. So by now they know their routine and they know how much they can push themselves, presumably. Um, it will be, it would be very interesting to, to see how that is handled to me because I haven't been at a high performance situation. Um, I would suggest that it seems as though some organizations are breaking up the travel. Uh, you mentioned Wheelchair Basketball Canada. From following uh, Athletics Canada, I've seen that they have done a pre-camp, if you will, or a staging camp in Spain. And that's that's been probably a week or more. So... They've been over, they've been acclimatizing themselves to the time changes and the different things so that they can get on the right page. But again, it all comes down to you know your body best. And so I would hope that the athletes are empowered to say, yeah, three hours, one way to train. No, I'm not doing that. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely the athlete does need to speak and use their their words and from what i understand from the couple of teams that i have spoken to uh the three hours wasn't so much an option but some of the practices were an option so if you didn't want to practice on certain days you know that uh, the optional morning skate sort of situation in hockey i think i'm hearing that in, in those situations where they had to travel that's what they were allowed to get and you have to listen to your athletes and the athletes have to listen to their body and it all has to work in conjunction with each other and you cannot worry about uh, you cannot be having the conversation of worrying about burnout when you're talking about the paralympic games because these athletes have been uh, building towards this for four years, if not longer than that, uh, if it's your first Paralympics or even not. Uh, as we actually close the show on this topic, um, I'm just curious, what do you guys believe will be, or let me put it this way, what do you expect will be a success story? And what's the story where you're like, mm, if this doesn't go well, this is where I could... I could mark this as a bit of a failure on either the Canadian Paralympic Committee or just just the the event of itself. Uh, Josh, try with you on that one. For me, I think the success will be in the pool. I think we have some great Paralympic level swimmers who are going to be representing us, whether it be Orly Rivard or others. So I think the pool will be strong. I think there will be medals from the track and from the field. I just, I don't know where they're going to come from. Uh, For me, as as sort of the the story I'm going to be watching is to see if my uh, cruisers teammate, Renee Fossell, can get 
onto the podium in some persuasion in what could possibly be her last Paralympics. Um, she has been knocking on the door for a number of them now, and it would be really, really exciting to see her actually end up on the podium this time. Uh, she's she's had a world record, as I recall, and she's been very close. She's She's been on the podium at world championships, possibly, but I don't believe she's done it at the Paralympics yet, so I would love to see that for her. Um, I think disappointment-wise, I think if the women's wheelchair basketball struggles, that's going to be a surprise because I think there's a lot of expectation on them. I think there's a lot of expectation on the men's program as well, but given the way the men qualified for the Paralympics, I really think that any medal they come home with will actually be a pleasant surprise. I'm really not expecting very much from them, especially the way they just competed in the uh, Paralympic warm-up tournament that they were just in. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. And maybe para-judo will be a thing. Maybe... Paraquestrian could be a thing. I don't know much about those. So I, I'm sure there will be surprises just like there were at the Olympics. But that's that's where I'm seeing things. Yeah, there's uh, both individual athletes and, and teams that are and have been just right there at knocking on the door of the podium. And uh, you're absolutely right. The women's wheelchair basketball team is one of those teams is – that over the last couple of years, they've proven that one, they can win tournaments and and beat those top teams and and become the top team to beat. Uh, but it's it's going to come down to uh, the Paralympic Games. They haven't been able to do that in quite some time, and uh, both programs, both men and women, are are really pushing to to turn around uh, the programs and and kind of bring it back to uh, what we all expected from, uh, Canadian basketball, um, back into the, the early nineties is it's, it's, it's good program and, uh, we've had a lot of success. And so, yeah, I believe that, uh, it would be, uh, kind of devastating if, uh, the women's wheelchair basketball team saw an early exit, um, like they did, um, uh, both in Rio and Tokyo, um, both finishing both times fifth, I believe, uh, and still, even those games felt attainable to get on the podium. And uh, so it's, it's, it's going to have to be a, a good tournament for uh, not just those starting five, but being able to use their entire bench. And in my opinion, that's kind of where the men's program is lacking is, is that they're playing their starting five quite a bit um, and not really tapping into uh, their bench, which is a young bench. Yes. And they are in a rebuild right now. Uh, we're going to see some retirement announcements come the end of the Paralympic games, uh, on both men and women's sides. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how both teams do because it, they do have different goals. I believe, I, I don't think it's a goal or, uh, realistically for the men's team to to say that they can podium um again like you said josh the way that they've been playing recently and what we've seen in their lead up to the games um it, it would be surprising to see That's it's so not encouraging. encouraging and I, I can only imagine what the athletes are feeling uh as well and yeah, Verne is, is very close to this, this show. And we've been hoping for her to have a medal, uh, for quite some time now. So that would be not only huge for Canada, but for us Ontario athletes and, and followers of her. And, uh, yes, we, uh, the track and field, uh, is always going to come away, I think with a lot of success and, uh, in the pool as well. Uh, but I, I think we're going to see some world records broken on the track uh, and possibly uh, in throwing as well. But I, again, like I alluded to earlier, I'm excited to hopefully catch some sports that I haven't caught in the past and and see how well we do there and 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 see if we can 
add some uh, some athletics and some sports that uh, maybe haven't had some success in Canada before and, and is uh, getting some of the limelight. I think uh, success stories could be your women's goalball team. That team has seemed to galvanize together and and make sure they qualify. I think success, I think we're all united on this. I think success could be the pool, absolutely. I, I'm i going to say it because I like to be frank on this program. I, if, if it wasn't for the format for wheelchair basketball, I'm not sure that that they even get into the quarterfinals of this tournament. They are going to get into the quarterfinals based on the fact that everybody gets into the quarterfinals. But this is not a team that I can speak a lot of you know, confidence in. Do they have the talent? Yes, certainly. But that talent is slowly aging and there's going to be a lot of turnover in relation to that as well. So it's going to be interesting. The games get going on uh, Wednesday this week with the opening ceremonies. And then they really kick off beginning uh, Thursday and for the 10 days or so after that. So stay tuned to uh, CBC Gem. Our program will be all over it over the next little while, both while it's on and afterwards. So we'll be all over it. And uh, we appreciate you tuning in. That's the end of our show for this week. I'd like to thank Josh Watson, Claire Buchanan. I'd also like to thank our technical producer, Mark Afalo. Stay tuned for next week because you just never know what happens when you enter the neutral zone. Be safe, be well. The Neutral Zone is brought to you by the Ontario Para Network. Connect with them at ON Para Network. Follow them online at onpara.ca. Now that's a winning combination.